final day of existence. From the very first day, he already saw the very last day. So here Moses wrote down God's personal prophetic declaration concerning humanity. How many want to know when the Lord's coming? He tells us right here. This is kind of cool, huh? We just don't understand it, but this is the clue is right here. Carnal humanity has exactly 120 days to do his own thing. Prophetically, that's what God said. Carnal humanity has exactly 120 days. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, God created natural man and he gave him dominion. Dominion has to do with self-governing, the ability to self-govern. That was God's will. So in Genesis chapter 1, God gives natural man the burden of self-governance. That's what he gave him. That was God's gift to natural man, the ability to govern himself. Then in chapter 6 of Genesis, God gives natural man a fixed amount of time before he removes the burden of self-governing. God said, this is how long I'm giving you to self-govern. 120 days or 120 years. This prophetic declaration in Genesis 6 is God telling us the exact time that man's dominion would end and the eternal kingdom of God would begin. How many want to know the unseen things, right? Isn't that like the only thing we really need is what God knows? How many are tired of hearing what we already know over and over and over, right? So God said, my spirit will not always strive with carnal humanity. My wind, that's what he said, my spirit, my ruach, my wind will not continually blow on the carnal vessel of humanity in the attempt to constantly correct their course. That's what it means. God said, I'm giving you this long for my wind to blow and constantly correct the course of this vessel. How many understand that if it wasn't for God's intervention throughout history, the chaotic way of Satan would have caused humanity to self-destruct literally eons ago? How many know we would have never made it this far with the chaotic mind of Satan ruling the earth? But God's wind, his ruach, that's what he was saying. He continually course corrects the ship. When God destroyed the earth with a global flood, it, had, it was literally because the world had become irredeemable. The world could no longer, had no potential for redemption. There was no potential for redemption. You've got to get this. All the clues point from the beginning to the end. So God destroyed the earth with a flood. Look at Genesis 6, starting at 11. The earth was corrupt, also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The earth was corrupt for one reason, the Bible says. The earth was filled with what? Violence. He said the earth became corrupt for one reason. One reason. The end and the beginning speak of each other. The alpha looks just like the omega. The earth was filled with violence. It's the Hebrew word kamas. Cruel, violent unrighteousness. The earth became filled, corrupted, by cruel, violent unrighteousness. Violence is behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill. Because of violence, the Bible says here, that God destroyed humanity. They became irredeemable. 
When violence becomes unrestrained, God's judgments are swift and sure. Remember this, the end and the beginning will always mimic each other. They always look alike. Here in verse 13, God declares his just retribution for unbridled violence. I will destroy them with the earth. I will destroy them. The word destroy is the Hebrew word shakoth. I will shakoth. It means I will utterly, completely, and absolutely bring them to a violent death suddenly. That's what he said. That's terrifying, isn't it? That's God. Look at Proverbs 29 and 1. He that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. I think this is one of the most terrifying scriptures in all of the Bible. The word suddenly shall suddenly be destroyed. The word suddenly is the word pathoth. It's instantly, in a moment, in the wink of an eye, and unexpectedly, suddenly. How many understand that Christianity has created their own God? And Christianity's God has unconditional love for humanity. You know, that gets Christians in a lot of trouble because when bad things happen that come from the judgment of God, all people do is get angry because we've preached an unconditional love. How many know there's no such thing? Right? Unconditional literally translates no limits. No limits. I even read one time where there was a woman that wrote a book and she said that Jesus walks through hell weeping over the souls there. How many know that's ridiculous? How many understand that that's just ridiculous? Christianity created a God in their own image. Notice that Genesis chapter 6, when humanity had reached a certain level of corruption through violence, the Bible says their doom was sealed. When they reached that level, there was nothing that could be done. How many have ever heard people mock and scoff the idea of doomsday? That's been mocked by the world for a long time. The word doom in Webster means condemned to a certain destruction or fate. Remember in Matthew 24, Jesus prophesied these words. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How many understand that Jesus already prophesied that it would look exactly like the days of Noah? He said in the end, it would look just like those days. The world would look just like those days. Noah built an ark in preparation for doomsday. Noah, how many know Noah believed in a doomsday? And I bet the people were mocking him. Can you imagine while Noah was building an ark? Can you imagine the mocking that went on? They had never had a flood. And now he's building an ark. He's building it in preparation for doomsday. Why? Because God's violence against the world was going to be inescapable. Here in Proverbs 29, Solomon prophetically declared that the day of destruction will be without remedy. No remedy. The word remedy is marpe, and it's got, the, it's got a Hebrew root, rafa. It means there will be no deliverance. There will be no salvation. There will be no physician. How many have ever heard of Jehovah Rapha? That's what he said. You'll no longer have access to me. How many know that's terrifying? There's no more potential. It literally translates, there'll be no salvation. There'll be no more potential. You'll have no access to Jehovah Rapha. That's a terrifying thought. How many understand that the ways of God never change? He's always the same, isn't he? If God hated something in the Old Testament, 
How many understand that he feels just as strongly about it now? The cross didn't change God's heart towards sin. It's still terribly offensive to him. God is still horribly offended by sin. When I see this verse in Proverbs 29, it makes me think of the word unpardonable. I used to preach a sermon called unpardonable when I was an evangelist. In fact, I had people get up and run out of that sermon when I would preach unpardonable. It was kind of terrifying. The word unpardonable literally translates unforgivable. Unforgivable. In Matthew 12, Jesus said that if anyone speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him in this world or in the world to come. That's what we refer to as unpardonable. How many find that thought terrifying? How many would rather sew your mouth shut? Here in Proverbs 29, Solomon says that there is apparently more than one unpardonable sin. Solomon says here that repeated warnings ignored lead to unpardonable. Repeated warnings ignored will lead to something that's unforgivable. No remedy literally translates no more potential for salvation. Remember in Jeremiah 51, we read this a couple weeks ago, where God said that he would have healed Babylon, but she would not be healed. Remember that? The New Living says, we would have helped her, but nothing can save her now. Why won't God save her? Why won't God save Babylon in the last day? Her sin's unpardonable. I want to show you something. Maybe this won't take me long today. I say that every week, but I think this will. Second Chronicles 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. How many would wonder why God would allow an evil man to reign for 55 years? Manasseh's son was just as evil and God killed him after two years. God's ways have nothing to do with the way we think, do they? Like under the abominations of the heathen, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Like under the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah's father had broken down. And he reared up the altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven. And he served them. And also he built altars in the house of the Lord, where of the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And he observed times and used enchantments and he used witchcraft and he dealt with familiar spirits and with wizards and he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image, an idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do that all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. How many... <clears throat> 
read The Harbinger by Jonathan Cahn. Anybody? A couple of you? If you didn't read it, it's, it's worth it. Anything that Jonathan Cahn, or most of the stuff that he's read, it's worth reading. But he proves how that the United States was chosen by God in the beginning, in her inception, even as a type of Israel. And he explains it in depth, and it's awesome. <clears throat> the father of Manasseh was Hezekiah. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 29 that Hezekiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Of course, David wasn't his father, he was his descendant. But he did according to all that David did, Hezekiah did. Hezekiah was one of the godliest kings that Judah had. I believe that Hezekiah prophetically represents the earliest governments of the United States of America. How many understand that everything in the Old Testament is prophetic of everything in the New? How many understand we live in the New Testament? Right? How many know the book of Acts just continues? And so when you look at the Old Testament, you can find prophetic truth about what's happening. And I believe that Hezekiah prophetically represents the earliest governments of the United States of America. Hezekiah, just like the governments of the United States, had a desire to follow the ways of Christ, even as King Hezekiah followed in the steps of his father David. I believe that the government of the United States was founded by men who wanted to do as much as humanly possible to have a government that was just before God and before the people. How many believe that? The name Hezekiah in the Hebrew means God is my strength. The Bible says that Hezekiah was attacked by King Sennacherib. King Sennacherib was a king of Assyria. And he was also attacked by the Philistines. But the Bible says that God gave him victory when God intervened. God intervened in these wars. He shouldn't have won, but God intervened. He should have been destroyed, but God intervened and gave him victory. I believe that this is a type of the United States involvement in the world wars where we acquired victory in seemingly impossible. How many have ever studied the world wars and you've seen places in battles that have turned the entire war around? And the United States can only claim victory because God intervened. And I believe it's the type of Hezekiah. And I believe that at that time, the government of America was still doing the will of God. I believe that the government of America at that time during the world wars was still involved with the will of God. The will of God was being done on earth just the way God wanted it to be. Remember, God said, I'll only continue to blow on the ship and keep it going in one direction for 120 years. Correcting the course. How many know the United States has been used to correct the course of the globe? Look what the writer of Chronicles wrote in 2 Chronicles 32. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor. And he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices, for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses for the increase of corn and wine and oil, stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities, possession of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. This same Hezekiah stopped up the watercourse of, the, of Gion and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in how many of his works? All. Because Hezekiah followed the right ways of God, he and all of Judah became extremely prosperous. In a 2006 campaign speech, 
Barack Obama, who was running for his first term, declared these words. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. And I thought about that. What Obama didn't understand is this. And you've got to listen to this from the way God sees it, from God's perspective. What Obama didn't understand, and most Christians don't understand, is that this nation was never a Christian nation. From its inception, it was not a Christian nation. There literally is no such thing. But what we once were was a nation whose government did the will of God for God's purposes and God's plan. It's not that the men were Christians. It's not that the men were what you would call believers. It's that the men were, had the fear of God and they did the will of God. You don't think that that can be true, but it's absolutely true. I was just telling my dad before church, I was watching a thing on John Rockefeller. How many watched that on the History Channel that you saw the thing on John Rockefeller? John Rockefeller was a Catholic. And when he was, uh, he began a petroleum business, making kerosene out of oil in Cleveland, Ohio. John Rockefeller came from a poor, poor family, barely had anything to eat. His mother basically raised him. His dad was a shyster who was always gone. And John was very competitive his whole life. And in, in Ohio, he started this little refinery business, which was going bankrupt. And he got a call from, from the Vanderbilt, who owned the, ra the railroads. Most of the railroads was the most powerful man. Vanderbilt was the most powerful man in the United States. And he called Rockefeller, John Rockefeller, because he wanted to connect with him and put John Rockefeller's oil on his trains so he could make money. We don't look at it like that's just a business deal, but it was the hand of God. It's amazing how this works. And I never thought about it till I saw this, but it was the hand of God. Because John Rockefeller was supposed to go to New York City and meet Vanderbilt. And that morning he got up, he was supposed to leave. The train was leaving at 6.30 in the morning from Ohio to go to, to, go to New York City. And he put his luggage on a, in a cart and they took his luggage and put it on the train and he was to follow the luggage and to be on the train by 6.30. But the man who was to put him on a, on a wagon and take him to the train station, his horse had trouble. He blew a shoe or something. And Rockefeller was late and he missed that train. And on the way to New York, that train going over a large trestle, the trestle fell apart. And that train fell into a gorge and everyone on that train was killed. John Rockefeller heard about that and he knew that was God. He knew God spared him. And from that moment on, his whole outlook changed because he knew he had a purpose. He didn't, it wasn't an evangelistic purpose. It wasn't a purpose to lead people to Christ. It wasn't a purpose, but he had a purpose and he knew it. He went to Vanderbilt on another train and he talked to that man and he had a whole new outlook on life. He didn't go in as a man who was losing his business to bankruptcy because he knew that God was going to spare his business. He went in and he told him, this is the price I want and this is what you'll give me and we're going to, he said, and if you don't do this with me, I will ship my oil with every other train company in the nation. I will fill them with my oil. Vanderbilt said, okay. He set him up, John, John, uh, began to get richer and richer. Rockefeller was richer and richer. His oil was shipping. All of a sudden, the train, uh, the train conglomerate tried to put him out of business because they wanted his business, and they wanted to take his money. So all of a sudden, he's out in the field one day looking at the refinery, and he sees these pipes taking oil from one part of the refinery to the other, and he begins to think, you know, if I could make oil ship it in pipelines all over the East Coast, I could cut out all the trains. You don't think God... And they said from that moment on, the entire United States became the most powerful nation on earth because of one man. 
who was spared by God, given a vision. He wasn't this on fire evangelistic believer Christian. He was just a man who knew he was called by God to do the will of God on earth as it was in heaven. Isn't that an amazing story? There's no such thing as a Christian nation. It's just a nation doing the will of God. But slowly the nation became corrupted in her prosperity as each generation became more proud. Then at the height of prosperity, the Bible says Hezekiah died. And the Bible says his son Manasseh was born. How many understand that sometime between World War II and the present, something spiritually died and something else came into power? You know it as well as I know it. Now what we need to understand is that there have always been evil people in every nation. And there have always been evil people in every government. But how many know that God can still work with that? It's when a government becomes irreversibly corrupt that God's judgment comes. We are currently being ruled by Manasseh. Second Chronicles 33 verses 1 and 2 again. Manasseh was 12 when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Remember this. Hezekiah means God is my strength. How many remember that? God is my strength. That was the United States before World War II. How many want to know what the name Manasseh means? It's a Hebrew name. It means to neglect and to forget. To forget is defined as to cease to remember until you are unable to recall. To forget is to treat with thoughtless inattention or even to disregard on purpose. God adamantly warned Israel over and over, always remember and do not forget. Look at Deuteronomy 8. Beware that you don't forget the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when you've eaten and you're full and you've built good houses and you've dwelt in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. How many understand that this is a national warning? This was to a nation. This wasn't to a person. This was to a nation. If an individual forgets God, you need to know this. If you as a person forget God, you may suffer no ill effects until you cross over into eternity. You may not even realize that you've forgotten God until you stand before him. But that's not true of a nation, or specifically a nation that's been called by God for a specific purpose. So when should a nation beware when should a nation pay particular attention not to forget? When is the greatest potential to fall away and to forget what God has done? Well, we just read it. When you have full bellies, when you have nice homes, when you have enough money, and when you have so much stuff that you need storage space. That's what he said. I didn't make any of that up. Then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. When all these things happen, this is a warning for all time. When you have enough food and enough money and enough 
fuel in your furnace and everything's good, then your heart has the potential to be lifted up. And you have the potential at that point to forget the Lord thy God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. This is when nations who have a mandate from God all eventually collapse. The Lord warned this because it's inevitably the way of human nature. The word, is, the word inevitable means it's unavoidable. There's no escape. It literally has no potential to be otherwise. Proverbs 16 says pride goes before destruction. How many know that that means 100% of the time pride paves the way for destruction? When a nation becomes proud instead of thankful, the end is in sight. To be thankful is to remember. To be proud is to forget. How many were disgusted when the, they started changing the name Thanksgiving to Turkey Day? It's just the way of a nation. That's the way of a nation. Because a nation that's proud is not thankful. Manasseh was born in the midst of prosperity and privilege. How many know we live in a generation... Now, a lot of you are old enough to remember what it was like to struggle pretty desperately as kids. <clears throat> Even as John Rockefeller. You know, you struggle as a kid. You maybe didn't have quite enough. We remember those days. We're all, but we live in a generation now where there's very little struggle. There's very little, it's easy to get money. The government will just send it to you. If you wait, they'll send you what they call stimulus checks. Manasseh was born in the midst of prosperity in a generation of privilege. He knew nothing except luxury and ease. He forgot the God of his fathers. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Enum. And he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft. And he dealt with familiar spirits and with wizards. And he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So Manasseh forgot God. And the proof was that his government encouraged the slaughter of babies. Remember, the end looks a lot like the beginning. So like Noah's day, the earth is once again corrupted by violence. In December of 1987, <clears throat> Democratic Senator Bob Casey Sr. of Pennsylvania said this, I believe abortion to be the ultimate violence. He compared abortion to murder, saying it's a unique kind of killing, even comparable to the Holocaust. This was a Democrat from Pennsylvania. Amazingly, during the Holocaust, the German people ignored the Nazi slaughter of the Jews. How many remember reading about that? Why would they do that? <clears throat> Well, there were several different factors. The German's economy before that had become completely dysfunctional after World War I. Politically, it was chaotic and the people desperately desired strong leadership. They didn't trust the government at all anymore. Nobody wanted to work and employment was out of control. The German people had stopped working. Sounds familiar, huh? Unemployment was out of control. Hitler was eventually appointed chancellor in the early 30s, in the early 1930s. And his Nazi party began by forcing people to go back to work. Within several years, the German economy was booming. And at that point, the people had full bellies, warm homes, and lots of possessions. 
This was the distraction that allowed the Nazis to exterminate over six million Jews right under the noses of these comfortable German people. The same ruse has been used many times throughout history. Give the people financial stability and comfort, and they'll remain silent and uncritical no matter what atrocities you engage in. As long as we are financially sound, whatever else you do, we're fine with. Remember what Moses wrote in Genesis chapter 6. He said, the earth became corrupt in God's sight when the earth became filled with violence. God never saw the earth corrupt because people were poor. He never saw the earth corrupt because people couldn't didn't want to work or couldn't find a job. He never saw the earth corrupt until the earth was filled with violence. How many remember the Keep America Beautiful movement that started in the early 70s? How many remember the commercials? For years before that, people would throw trash on the ground. They'd throw trash out of their vehicles. They'd throw trash on the ground. And then they started a Keep America Beautiful campaign. I've seen videos of trash-covered streets and sidewalks in the 60s and 70s where people would just be walking along and throw their stuff. They didn't even think about it. Nobody really considered it wrong until we saw the TV commercial with the Italian actor who was named Iron Eyes Cody. How many remember Iron Eyes Cody? Yep, sure you do. Iron Age Cody was the Indian with the, with the feather. Remember? <clears throat> he was paddling his canoe down the river, and the river was filled with, you were too young, Paulette. The river was filled with newspaper, remember? And garbage. He dragged his canoe up onto the shore, and there was just clutter with just garbage everywhere. And he walks up, uh, uh, and he stands beside a freeway. Google this video, you can still get it. He stands beside, Iron Eyes Cody is standing beside the freeway. You know he's an Italian actor. He wasn't even really a Native American. He was Italian. His name was Causey something, I can't remember. But he's standing beside a freeway, and somebody throws this big bag, and I don't know what it is, but it looks like a McDonald's bag, and it explodes at his feet, and all the debris go all over. Does it ring a bell? Anybody remember And while he's standing there, the turns his head a little bit and the camera shows and there's a tear that runs down his cheek. It said, help keep America beautiful. They said that was the most beautiful commercial ever made or one of the top most beautiful commercials ever made, most moving. Can you imagine what America would look like if the people still treated the land with the same, dis same degree of disrespect that we did in the 60s and the early part of the 70s. I remember people throwing garbage out their windows into cars driving down the road, right? Car needs cleaned out. Psalm 106. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. And they shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. The land was polluted. You know, we've worked diligently to keep America beautiful by continually fighting against litter and pollution. And in our eyes, America is still beautiful. When I see pictures of Yosemite or Yellowstone, it's absolutely breathtaking. It took a lot of hard work to keep it that way, but when Americans look at, Americans look at America, they still see the same beauty, don't they? But through God's eyes, how many know that's all that matters is what it looks like through God's eyes? Through God's eyes, he still sees the land as vile and polluted because it's been filled with innocent blood. The word blasphemy in Webster means great dishonor shown to God through something said or something done. 
We thought blasphemy was just something you said, wasn't it? Actually, the word blasphemy means something that shows dishonor to God by something said or something done. Remember, Jesus said blasphemy was unforgivable, didn't he? Look at 2 Kings 24. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up in Jehoiakim, became his servant three years, and he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldees and the bands of Syrians and bands of Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon. And he sent them against Judah to destroy it. It's a terrifying thought. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. To remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. According to all that he did. And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. Which the Lord would not pardon. How many knew that abortion was an unpardonable sin? I'm not talking about the girls that have an abortion. I'm talking about a government. God will still forgive a young lady who's misguided and ends up aborting a child. But God won't forgive a government for allowing it. God holds a government responsible for what goes on in the nation. Manasseh the king and Manasseh the generation have both sinned the same unpardonable sin. When a nation wholly embraces the evil of the shedding of innocent blood by the murder of multitudes of babies, the God of justice takes up arms to destroy that nation. When you see the U.S. destroyed by fire in one day, in one hour, even as Jeremiah 51 says and Revelation 18 says, you can be certain that the punishment will fit the crime. When I look at Pennsylvania, and I'm saddened by Pennsylvania because, you know, Bob Casey Sr. despised abortion. And Bob Casey Jr. ran on an anti-abortion ticket against Rick Santorum. And he soundly beat, it was a shock, he soundly beat Rick Santorum. Because Rick Santorum was the anti-abortion guy. He was an absolute pro-life guy. And Bob Casey Jr. ran on the anti-abortion ticket. Even the Catholic Church said, look, we've got exactly what we want. We have a Democrat who's pro-life. And they voted him in. But the government completely changed Bob Casey Jr., and he is absolutely pro-choice now. And when they voted in a, a Democratic Shapiro and a Democratic Fetterman, I looked sad. I thought I would have rather seen the financial world of the government of the United States fall into pieces if we could have just kept all these pro-choice men out. I wouldn't care what else happened to the, to the nation as long as it protected the children. I was so disappointed. And that was the only reason it had nothing to do with anything else. Did you know that John Fetterman flies uh, the gay flag for one of, I don't know, LGBTQ flag every day outside of his lieutenant governor's office? And he calls abortion health care. And I read, a, I read a man wrote in the Catholic Chronicle. And he said this was one of the saddest days in the history of Pennsylvania. Because we've just embraced an unpardonable thing in, in this nation, in this state. We've embraced... There are enough people who have embraced this and said it's okay with them. 
and the pollution that God sees now increased in this nation. I don't know about you, but it breaks my heart. People might say, but we've never been involved with abortion. But if you look across America, you'll notice that a great multitude of people voted for those who will take those votes as a nod of approval to continue to sacrifice innocent children on the altars of their demon gods. And to Almighty God, this type of pollution is unpardonable. Amen. If you'll stand with me. Father, I truly believe that we've, as a nation, and I'm not talking about these, these believers because I know these beautiful people love you and they love children and they love your way and they want to see your will done. But it saddens us for a nation who was chosen, selected by God for a purpose, who have so turned against the ways of God. And Father, this nation has lost its ability to be thankful. Like Manasseh, they've become a privileged nation. A nation that expects everything to be given to them. Lord, this nation has changed over the last 60 years into something that's unrecognizable. Saw a man from World War II weeping after the elections. He's over 100 years old, weeping, saying this doesn't look anything like the nation that I fought for. Father, we're sorry for the sin even of the church that's allowed this to go on. We don't know what to do. We're lost. And we don't know what to do. We cry out to you, O oh God, to give us wisdom. We feel like the German people during the Holocaust, if we would know, we are, but we know about it. We've known about it. And so, Father, I pray that your will would be done again. And, Father, that our hearts would be right with you. And if there's anything that we can do to stop this pollution or to slow this pollution down or to even save, even as Oscar Schindler desperately did everything he could to save every life that he could during World War II, to save those Jewish lives. And Lord, I know that he was rewarded by you for what he did. I know that. And God, I would ask you to give us wisdom. What would you have us to do? Give us the wisdom. What would you have us to do in this day, during this time? Father, even as we meet with our friends and families this week for, for Thanksgiving, Father, forgive us if we've forgotten you even for one second. Forgive us. Lord, we want to only see you. We want to only remember you. Lord, whatever it costs us, we just want to know you. Desperately, we need to know you. I pray for this people today. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to draw us to our knees to cry out for those who are still have potential to know Jesus, for the lost who still have the potential for salvation. I believe there are people, multitudes of people, who you're going to save in this last day. I believe you differentiate between the people and the government. And Father, so I pray that we would continue to cry out for the lost, that you would save that young girl that would otherwise get an abortion. That you would save her, Father. That she would come to know Jesus and to see the error of her way. And that she would seek you, Lord. 
I pray that you would save her. Lord, that you would bring these young ladies, these young women, this young generation, that you would bring them to Christ. God, Jesus is still the only answer for a world that's lost and dying. Jesus Christ is still the only answer. Is there a balm in Gilead? His name is Jesus. Let this generation begin to seek you. And these evil men and women who would desire that the blood of children would soak the altars of their demon gods would be stopped as these young women begin to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would start a revival and that you would save pregnant young women. God, I never even saw that before, but I believe that's a desire of your heart. That you would stop them, that wisdom would speak to their hearts, and that Jesus would give them hope again. We pray for that, Lord. We love you. You are worthy. Be with each one this week. Keep them safe. Give them a, a wonderful time with their families. And be with them, I pray. Draw their hearts back to you that we would be thankful again in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.